Hello all and welcome back to our new video. Today, we will again focus on the Game of Thrones books and discuss the top 5 prime contenders to be the Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. This is assuming that Jon Snow is the one who will be sitting on the throne at the end. In short, here we will be looking at the possible wives of Jon Snow, who will rule the Seven Kingdoms with him at the end of the books. We have seen Jon Snow as the major POV in the books and so we can safely exclude Arya Stark from the list. Even though Jon Snow might end up being a Targaryen, but still there is absolutely no way he will end up marrying his favorite Arya, whom he has always thought as a sister. So, without wasting any time, let us jump into the list. At number 1 we have Daenerys Targaryen. Crowd favorite, who is perhaps destined to be on the Iron Throne. And the show has left no stone unturned to show her as Jon's love interest. But what does the books have to show? She is a Targaryen who wants to marry a Targaryen. Though the same Targaryen might be a fake, but that does not belittle her hidden wish. Both John and Daenerys are of same age and Daenerys' beauty has always stood out. If the news spread that John is a Targaryen, then it will be enough for the marriage to take place. When Daenerys visits the House of the Undying in Karth, she has faced a whole mess of prophetic visions, including this one, a blue flower grew from a chink in a wall of ice, and filled the air with sweetness. There's only one major wall of ice in the series, and that's the wall protected by the Night's Watch. As for the blue flower, Lyanna Stark was crowned with her favorite flowers, Blue Winter Roses, by Prince Rigor Targaryen before he stole her away. This seems to imply that Daenerys will have some kind of sweet connection with Lyanna's son who is currently up at the wall. In a dance with dragons, just as Jon is being stabbed to death by the Night's Watch, Daenerys hears a lone wolf howling in the Dothraki Sea, which makes her feel sad and lonely. It's probably just a normal wolf in the literal sense, but the way that George R. R. Martin juxtaposes the two chapters, it's almost as if Daenerys is empathizing with Jon's pain from the other side of the world. Comparing their pets, John's pet is a dire wolf who is white with red eyes. Daenerys' favorite dragon Drogon is black but with red eyes. It seems as if John is already attached with Daenerys' white beauty and Daenerys has preferred John's choice of colors. Also, they started their arcs in the same manner. Both Dany and John have negative thoughts on the Dothraki and wildlings. Then both of them fall in love with the same people whom they initially hated and lead these people to a peaceful life. Soon both their initial loves dies with both John and Dany being blamed for it. John betraying Mance which led to Igrit getting killed in the battle while Daenerys forces her husband to be treated by Magi Mirai Mazdur who put her husband in a vegetative state. While John led the Night's Watch which killed Igrit. Daenerys herself had to smother the comatose Drogo with a pillow. The show has already showed both of them getting physical and this is a big sign that they can end up together. At number 2, we have Marjorie Tyrell. She may have been dead in the shows, but there is a possibility that a talented lady like her will not meet the kind of ending which is shown in the shows. In the Game of Thrones, where you win or you die, she is the one who plays the game in the best possible manner. The way she handled the psychotic Joffrey is the biggest proof how well she plays her cards. The same Joffrey who made the life of Sansa a living hell, became a pet dog of Marjorie. She always manages to marry the one who has the strongest claim to the throne. Be it Renly Baratheon, or Joffrey, or the kid Tommen. 
if she truly survives and the news of John's Targaryen bloodline spreads, then Marjorie will surely find a way to marry John. And a sultan like John may certainly fall into her manipulative ways. The only way GRRM will prevent this marriage is by putting an end to her character, which is shown in the show. But again, the books might not follow the show and keep her alive to be John's bride. This will ensure that the ending is bittersweet which GRRM has already claimed. At number 3, we have Sansa Stark. A lot of fan following has been built on Jon Sansa since the last couple of years and it may end up to be true as well. George R. R. Martin has fueled it in the books by giving an invisible connection between Sansa and Jon. This might take a while. So let's us relax and discuss about it in different sections. 1. Love Interests of Sansa Stark Sir Waymar Royce, Ranger from Night's Watch What Sansa liked about him, it's not clear but it can be assumed that being Ranger has attracted her. Prince Joffrey Baratheon, Crowned Prince of Iron Throne What Sansa liked about him, Handsome Prince who is the heir to the King's Landing. Sir Loras Tyrell, Extremely Talented Warrior what Sansa liked about him, tall, handsome knight's natural curly hair who present her with roses. Now looking at Jon Snow, Jon has all the qualities that has made Sansa fall for these three guys. Waymar Royce, Sansa's first crush, is described to be tall, slender, and graceful, dark-haired and having beautiful grey eyes. That's how Jon Snow is also described in the books. When Sansa fell in love with Waymar, his age was 19. When Sansa left Winterfell, Jon was 14 at the time. Three years have passed till the point where Jon was stabbed by the watch. This points out that Jon was 17 years old at that time. Maybe a year will pass before Jon meets Sansa possibly after the Battle of the Bastards. If it truly happens, the John will be 18 when Sansa meets him again, making her remind of her first love. That's not a coincidence, George did on purpose. If John's parentage is cleared in the books, then he will undoubtedly have the first claim to the Iron Throne. With Varys backing him, as shown in my first video, Jon Snow will have a solid chance of ruling the Seven Kingdoms. This will certainly push Sansa closer to Jon as she has pushed herself towards Joffrey in the beginning. Sansa's crush for Loras was momentarily, but in that moment she witnessed her love to be taller than her, have curls and deep brown eyes. Now Jon has grey eyes which is similar to deep brown eyes. Also he is taller than Sansa and is famous for his curls. Some extremely similarities that Jon shares with Ser Loras. And also the fact that Sansa was willing to marry Loras forgetting that he swore not to marry also remind us of Jon's vow. A hell of similarities. 2. Love Interests of Jon Snow Igrit, Wildling Ranger Girl what Jon Snow liked about her, her fiery red hair. Ygritte was not considered to be beautiful, but Jon liked her because of her red hair which was described as fiery. Jon considers red-haired girl as beautiful who were kissed by fire. Readers first learn about Sansa from Jon's point of view. And according to him Sansa is radiant. Radiant meaning glowing, almost the same as fiery. Now how has Caitlin described Sansa in the books, more beautiful than Caitlin herself with auburn hairs which glows like copper near fire? Auburn is just another term of red and near fire there is no match to her shine which would snatch the light of the torches. Talk about being kissed by fire, 
Sansa is the living example of it. 3. The hidden link in the social status. When series started, their social status was polar opposite. Jon Snow was a bastard while Sansa was a lady. When both left Winterfell, Jon accepted a life abandoning the society while Sansa chased a life with highest social status. Till here Jon and Sansa together were filling up the void which the other one was missing. After Ned's death, both of them captured by enemies. Jon wanted to run to his new home while Sansa wanted to run away from her new home. Jon plays with the enemy, wildlings, while Sansa is played as a pawn by the enemy, Lannister. Jon Snow is referred to as a crow. Sansa on the other hand is referred to as a little bird. Mind you, crows are considered to be ugly but smart but little birds are attractive but dumb. Soon Jon ends up being physical with Ygritte while Sansa is married to Tyrion. Jon beds the enemy but doesn't wed her. Sansa weds her enemy but doesn't bed him. Both of them again completing the void left by the other. Later Jon flees to his new home while Sansa flees away from her new home. Jon grows higher in status and is referred to as Lord, the male version of Lady. Sansa has now been reduced to bastard status and is referred to as Stone, the Vale's version of Snow. Thus both of them have now witnessed the whole life. Jon rising from rags to rich while Sansa falling from riches to rag. For the hidden desire. Jon always desired to be a true-born son who can be accepted by the society. He might get his wish fulfilled when his true parentage will be revealed. What has Sansa always dreamt of? To marry the prince who is to be the heir to a throne. She always stayed away from Jon in her childhood as he was bastard and ran after Joffrey as he was the prince who was the heir to the Iron Throne. But in reality it is just the opposite. Joffrey is the bastard and Jon is the prince and heir to the Iron Throne. If Sansa's wish is to be fulfilled just as Jon's then George R. R. Martin will pair up Jon with Sansa for sure. There is foreshadowing of Caitlin Stark celebrating Jon's decision of going to the Wall and not fathering children that could contest Winterfell, he would father no sons who might someday contest with Caitlin's own grandchildren for Winterfell. If Jon truly have sons someday, then the only way they won't compete with Caitlin's own grandchildren will be if Jon's sons are Caitlin's own grandchildren. That would mean the mother will have to be Sansa or Arya. Rob Stark wanted Jon to take over Winterfell after his death to prevent it from falling into Lannister's hand by virtue of Sansa's marriage to a Lannister. But his will never became public. Also Jon has rejected Winterfell's ownership by stating it to Stannis that Winterfell belongs to Sansa only. Now if Rob's wish of Jon's rule over Winterfell is to come true along with Winterfell staying under Sansa, then there is just one way it can happen, a formal marriage between Jon and Sansa. Also Jon and Sansa had a hidden desire of rebuilding Winterfell and naming their kids after their siblings. 5. George R. R. Martin's Wordplay You all know how G. R. R. M. plays with his words. His genius in wordplay can sometimes makes his intention dancing right in front of you but still evading the eyes. Notice how in John's chapter, he always refers Arya as little sister. This makes readers believe that John is referring Arya as little sister and Sansa as elder sister. But fact is John is older than Sansa. So age-wise, both Sansa and Arya were to be his little sister. Another way little sister can be used if John is referring to Arya's short height. If that is the case, then in his mind Sansa would be the tall sister. But John is taller than Sansa. 
so that debate is also kept aside now. That makes just one sense, John just loves calling Arya little sister, without any comparison with Sansa. And the only time he referred Sansa as sister when he was interacting with Stannis. And there too was mincing his words, so that Stannis will not get the complete picture, like what Eddard Stark thinks of Stannis. Never in his thoughts, he has called Sansa as his sister. So, there is a strong possibility that he doesn't consider her as his sister after all. Sansa Snow Encounter The snow drifted down in ghostly silence. All color fled except for white's black and gray. See how secretly GRRM has bought Jon Snow into the picture, whose dire wolf is ghost and he never makes a sound. Jon Snow, who is white, though not as white as rest of the Stark family, wears black and has gray eyes. It seems that GRRM deliberately want viewers to picture as Jon Snow when Sansa is alone and searching for happiness. Snowflakes brushed her face like a lover and she can taste snow on her lips. Just replace Snowflakes as Jon Snow and you will get, Jon Snow brushed her face like a lover and she can feel Jon Snow on her lashes, like seeing him too close to her and taste him on her lips. Like kissing Jon Snow, which is her dream. Sky was lighter shade of grey, showing as if Jon Snow is staring her all the time, a fact that many readers assume that Jon Snow have been staring at Sansa from a distance with Sansa ignoring him all the time. Then Sansa thinks of building a snow knight. Maybe trying to turn Jon Snow into a knight, a knight who protects ladies, in accordance with Sansa version of knights. The snow fell and castle rose. It predicts when Jon Snow drops his snow surname by adopting Targaryen title, her castle will rise. It was only a castle when she began, but before very long Sansa knew it was Winterfell. Sansa is actually making Winterfell with snow. Which can predict Sansa is making Winterfell with Jon Snow. Sansa's hero. The series talks about Lord Slint, who plotted with Littlefinger and falsely claimed his services to Eddard Stark. Only to betray him in front of Joffrey, killing all of Lord Stark's guards from behind and later raising the beheaded Stark's head to display it to the crowd. Sansa was angry at his presence, but couldn't do much against him. Though she has wished for some hero to come and behead Slint. Little did the readers knew that that hero would turn out to be Jon Snow himself. He first ordered Yano Slint to be hanged, bringing justice to the sufferings towards his family. But just in the end, GRRM took a poetic turn, decided to make Jon remember his father's way, the one who passes the sentence should swing the sword. A ruler who hides behind paid executioners soon forgets what death is. By doing so, GRRM has wittingly shown Jon Snow as Sansa's true hero. Politically, it covers everything. The Seven Kingdoms are The North ruled by Stark The Vale and the Mountains ruled by Arryn The Iron Islands and Rivers ruled by Greyjoy and Tully the Casterly Rock ruled by Lannisters. The Reach or High Garden ruled by Tyrell. The Stormlands ruled by Baratheons. And Dorne ruled by Martells. Jon has a decent relationship with Tyrion, which can make the Casterly Rock follow him. Being a Targaryen, the Dorne will back him for sure, while the Greyjoys will obey him out of the fear for the dragons. Sansa brings the North and the Vale to follow Jon. Also her excellent relationship with the Tyrells make the High Garden follow her. If Stannis dies and Gendry is proved to be Robert Baratheon's bastard, 
then he will inherit the storm lands. And Gendry marriage with Arya will throw Stormland's support behind Arya's closest sibling. Also if Samwell is the last Tully to survive, then the rivers will follow John wherever he goes. Thus this marriage will unite the Seven Kingdoms something which will be a fitting end to the great series. At number 4, we have Val, the Wildling Princess. This character was never introduced in the series and this may work against her chances of marrying John. However, the books has thrown their maximum weight behind Val. More than Igrit, Daenerys, and Sansa. To the ones who have not read the books, Val is the sister-in-law of Mance Raider, the king beyond the wall. Val's sister, Dalla dies while delivering Mance's son. Wildlings believe that Stannis had Mance burnt while Jon had ordered his men to shoot arrows which killed Mance Raider. However Jon Snow knows that Mance is saved by Melis Andre, unknown to the rest. The notion of a dead Mance Raider makes Val a strong prospect of leading Mance followers, as she is in charge of Mance's only child. Because of her extraordinary beauty, she is popularly called as Wildling Princess by the Knights and the Watch. But the Wildlings are afraid of her fierce nature because of which nobody succeeded in stealing or capturing her. In Wildling tradition of marriage, a man has to steal or capture a girl, fighting her and her kin to keep her as wife. In reality, it was Val who managed to steal Jarl, a wildling raider making Val stronger than a raider. Now how come she has such a high probability of being John's queen, let's have a look at it. In the books, Val was present in the tent where John was sent to meet Mance with a mission to kill him. Val was accompanying her sister there who was expecting her baby anytime. Before John could fulfill his mission of killing Mance, Stannis' army attacked the wildling camps and John no longer had the need to kill Mance. During the battle, we witness the conversation between John and Val. The conversation reminds us how they are looking at the same thing in a vastly different manner. The lady is not interested in the war around her and her sole focus is her sister's health. John concern is the outside world without caring about Val's sister. Val despite her fierce nature has lost her mental strength at this situation and somehow John makes her do the right thing by forcing her to be her sister's midwife. In wildling tradition, when a man captures a woman, the woman becomes his wife. John had earlier married Igrid without knowing it himself. Here Igrid clearly admits that she is John's wife and John as usual knows nothing. Now in the same way John has made Val his wife. Here again John has no idea about his marriage with Val but Val most probably knows it. Here Sam believes that John has captured Val. However, John doesn't believe that. He claims that he has not captured anyone but that doesn't change the way wildlings view the entire situation. Even Stannis Baratheon believes John has captured Val, though he had mistaken Val to be Mance's wife. So much discussion about Val's capture by John's hand means that Val might be on the same page as Sam and Stannis. And there is a possibility that Val is already viewing herself as John's wife. And if that is not enough for the readers, Stannis tried to make it official by forcing a marriage between John and Val. Later we see John exposing his want for Val. Though GRRM cleverly twisted it towards his love for Rob and his legitimacy rather than his love for Val, but for the first time we saw John wanting a girl purely for his own needs. Some feelings which he had not shown towards Igrit when she was alive. He might have ended up with Val surely, but the moment was stolen when he accidentally warged into his dire wolf. 
Ghost reminded John of the hidden wall between him and his siblings. It was like reading a love story plot when John looked at Val, from a distance and apologized to her in his mind. He wants to be with her but the society forbids it. A small part stolen from love story classics. The more Val is discussed, the more it is clear how well John understood Val despite not spending a lot of time with her. John warns Stannis that if he force Val to marry a man she does not want, she is likely to slit his throat on their wedding night. Later Gilly informs John that Val has promised not to slit the throat of the man she is forced to marry, only if Mance is spared. How well John has predicted what Val would do if she will be forced into a marriage. Slit his throat. John certainly matched Val's choice of words. Later we see how John thought of Val looking more regal than the king himself. And going on to describe her beauty makes it more obvious that he has started to fall for her. If that is not enough, John started comparing Val with his lost love Igrid. Here John thinks Val to be lonely and lovely. Igrid had been pretty in her own way, with her red hair kissed by fire, but it was her smile that made her face come alive. Val did not need to smile. Val slowly started to replace Igrid as John clearly prefers Val's beauty over Igrid. Val doesn't need to smile to look alive, unlike Igrid who needed her smile. Lonely, lovely, and lethal. John has started to regret his decision of not accepting Stannis' offer, when he stares at Val. From this point on George R. R. Martin stopped making Val just a love interest. He started to make her a part of John's life now. When John sent Val on a secret mission to convince Tormund to surrender and accept Stannis's offer of staying on the south of the wall, Val behaved more like John's girlfriend. Kissing John on his cheek and staying so close that their breath mingled shows that Val doesn't mind being close with John. And when she asked if John killed her first love, John replied the wall killed him. Now, the question is if the wall has a face, who could it be? John Snow of course as he is the Lord Commander of the Night Watch now. Thus, Indirectly he has also fulfilled the role of freeing Val from her previous husband as he has already done with Igrid by killing Orel. Then the light moment when John proves that she cares for Gilly's son even though Val tries to deny it, there is an obvious love in the air. When an obsessed knight want to meet Val, there is a slight heat in the conversation. George R. R. Martin has used this small part to hint that John is protective of Val. When Sir Axel said that he can have Val delivered naked for his inspection, John decides to leave before he forgets his duty of a host. John is showing some kind of lover's protection towards Val. John's feud with the knight is shown again and this time John's name is clearly linked with Val. Sir Axel Florent while talking with John says. Some say you have her tucked away for your own pleasure. It makes no matter to me, so long as she is not with child. Some sort of rumor which will be appreciated by John's fan who see him lonely. For long, it is shown that the dire wolves can sense the enemies and friends of their owners. George R. R. Martin cleverly reminded readers of this fact before showing that Ghost is so much comfortable with Val. And John thinks his dire wolf and Val belong together. Looking at Val, John claims that he has not seen a lovelier sight for a long time. Undoubtedly, this is the biggest clue that George R. R. Martin has shown anywhere in the books. In real world, a guy will decide whether he should marry his girlfriend or break up with her by simply checking his pet dog relationship with his girlfriend. If his pet dog is friendly with the girl, 
then the marriage is on cards. Here John's dire wolf has already approved of Val making her the strongest contender to be with John. John starts the conversation by taunting Val about trying to steal his wolf. And Val replied that she is. This is indirect way of expressing her desire to live with John. Tormund soon asks John to steal her before his own son Torridge steals her. And then we read John's feelings of Val's worthiness as a wife. And we could feel his disappointment of himself burning the bridge which would lead him to her. John welcomes Torridge to steal her which might have angered Val. When Tormund asks Val if she minds, Val says that she would geld Lord Crow if he dares. Readers take it in a negative way which makes them believe that Val doesn't have any feelings for John. But take a note of the choice of words. Till now Val has called John as Lord Snow or My Lord. Something that a lord's wife would have called while referring to her husband. At the point of threat, she said Lord Crow. This might point towards some other lords in the Negth Watch and not John particularly. Also, she needed to discourage Tormund's son from trying to steal her, so that she can stay as the wife of her previous captor, Jon Snow. Also there is a possibility that she is angry with Jon for asking Torridge to steal her. Very soon when Tormund leaves them and they are alone, Val hints Jon that she is her captive. But Jon as usual doesn't understand. Like the way he didn't understand Agrid's hints. Val inquires whether she should go back to her old cell. Old cell is the place where captives are kept. John tells her that she will be moved to Hardin's tower, where she can have more room but less comfort. Val replies that she would prefer freedom over comfort every time. John says she will have freedom inside the castle, but she is still under captivity. And to protect her from other visitors, who might steal her, John has his men and the giant Woon Woon guarding her. Here John unknowingly admits of protecting his wife. Val excitedly admits that she is in a better position than her sister Dalla, as Mance has never protected Dalla with giants. Next we see Val offering help to John and John looking at her warrior princess. This reminds us of Vaisanya Targaryen. Vaisanya was the first wife of Aegon Targaryen, who was beautiful yet fierce. And why Val will take the place of Vaisanya Targaryen? Because the show has confirmed that Jon Snow's real name is Aegon Targaryen. Thus there is a high probability that he will have two wives. One fierce and another kind-hearted. Val can be the fierce wife of the youngest Aegon Targaryen. When Jon asks Val to bend her knee to the queen, Val jokes of laughing when she bends. Jon strictly says she may not and Val obeys. Here she again refers Jon as Lord Snow and not Lord Crow. Also she is serious when she said that she would be a proper wildling princess as he commands. Later Jon asks Val to join him. The choice of words are similar to any lord's word who are asking his wife to join them. Val tells Jon that she is his captive. Here she refers Jon as Crow again, but in a playful tone. Here Val reminds Jon that she is his wife, taking a note of Jon's earlier conversation with Tormund. Later they encountered the Queen's Knight. Sir Patrick fell head over heels for Val's beauty. But Val called the knight as Sir Kneeler and treated him as a dog, which almost made John laugh. Later in front of the queen, Val joined John in kneeling, which was against her wildling customs. Val though had a war of words in her meeting with the queen. This made the queen comment on the wildness of Val. The queen said she must find a husband for Val who can teach her courtesy. 
and immediately looked at John. This is Martin's classical way of telling his story. The queen wanting to find a suitable husband for Val and then turning her glare on John. This is a symptom that John will be the suitable husband for Val. Remember how John managed to make Val kneel in front of the queen when she was presented to her. Undoubtedly, John can teach her courtesy which the queen is looking in her husband. Later an angry Val informed John that she has lesser hair between her legs. John is known by the readers for his mouth work and Val has already shown what is in store for him. In the first book John jokes with Arya Stark that women should shave and comments on Septa's legs. This confirms that John dislikes body hair in a woman, making Val perfectly fit for him. John was taken aback by Val's anger about the queen's daughter who has grey scales. She said that she would have killed her if she was born to her. When John persisted that the child is not a threat, Val says the words that still reminds John of his lost love, you know nothing, Jon Snow. Maybe Jeroj R. R. Martin has created a grit so that John can fall in love with Val. Later the Queen informs John that she is planning Val to be married to Sir Patrick. John predicts a savage beating if he is caught by Val's kin. Sir Patrick laughed, claiming that his courage cannot be questioned. But soon we witness Sir Patrick being killed by Woon Woon. Maybe it was Sir Axel cunning plan to get rid of Sir Patrick and claim Val for his own self. And it has worked wonder, as this small battle between Woon Woon and Sir Patrick made John inattentive towards the daggers held by the men of Night's Watch, who stabbed John to death. With John dead, Val doesn't have any protection now. Except for the giant Woon Woon who was stationed there by John to protect Val. Thus by Wildling Customs, John successfully managed to save his wife from being stolen. This strengthens Jon Snow's claims over Val, even though he is dead at the end of it. This has gone longer than Sansa's explanation. But there is another interesting notion about Jon and Val relationship. In the shows, the wildlings are showing undying loyalty towards Jon. Mostly because of a deal between Jon and Tormund. But in the books, the deal is between Tormund with Stannis. Not with Jon who is already dead in the books. When Jon will be resurrected, there is no way the wildlings will follow his lead as Jon has still not done anything for them yet. If Jon has to lead the wildlings into the Battle of the Bastards, then there might be just one way to it. The way through Val. Val has to publicly announce her marriage with John to ensure that her wildling followers follow John's commands. Tormund also need to be convinced but once Val explains the picture of John capturing her, Tormund will also sworn for John making sure that the books follow the sequence of the show. Also one thing that stands out about Val is her wild personality. She is referred to as the Wildling Princess meaning a princess who is wild. There is another princess who was wild. And we are not talking about Arya Stark. We are talking about Lyanna Stark here. The wild Lyanna Stark who was stolen by Rhaegar Targaryen and Jon Snow was born out of their union. This is a potential parallel by George R. R. Martin. John following his father's footsteps, has already captured the wild princess. And it is about time that he marries her. At number 5, we have an unnamed lady who is the daughter of Tyrion Lannister. The show has left this part as they felt that she can be replaced easily. But in the books, Tyrion is on a quest looking for his wife Tisha and his daughter. Some theories claim that a prostitute called the Sailor's Wife could actually be Tisha and her daughter Lana could be Tyrion's daughter. 
Lana, like her mother is also a prostitute. Be it Lana or some other girl, a daughter of Tyrion means that she has the rightful claim on the Casterly Rocks and she is more powerful than Daenerys, Marjorie, or Sansa when it comes to kingdom they are ruling. Daenerys is ruling Mirian now, Marjorie ancestors are ruling the High Garden and Sansa ancestors has ruled the North. The Casterly Rocks is considered more powerful than any of these and this makes Lana the most powerful lady after Cersei and Marcella Lannister. The series has started with Jon Snow watching the long shadow of the small Tyrion. After a small feud, mostly because of Tyrion's harsh choice of words, Jon realized that Tyrion is truthful and has considered him a friend who will not lie to him like his father or uncle. There was a mutual respect when the parted ways and it is only proper that when they meet again at the end of the series, they will formalize their relationship by marrying Jon with Tyrion's daughter. The series is based on the rivalry of the Starks, Lannisters, and Targaryens. This marriage can ensure that everything ends well. John being a Stark and a Targaryen while his wife being a Lannister. Also, it fits well with Martin's storytelling of how John rose from bastard to King of the Seven Kingdoms while the Queen of the Seven Kingdoms is actually living a life full of poverty and possibly a life of prostitute before sitting on the Iron Throne. So who do you think will be John's wife in the books? You can always guess, though it is George R.R. R. Martin who will decide the lucky one.